Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. Of the Word of God. And turn with me to the gospel record of Mark. The gospel record of Mark in chapter number 15. The gospel record of Mark in chapter 15. We are on our final stretch. Our last messages of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ as we see it through the gospel record of Mark. And we've already seen Jesus Christ spend his last several hours in his earthly ministry with his disciples. He has gone to the Garden of Gethsemane and took time to pray. And as we examine that prayer meeting, we could see why that was such an important prayer meeting. More than even the disciples, more than Peter understood how important that prayer meeting truly was. We witnessed the illegal trial and we took time to lengthen and to describe All the ways that trial was illegal, especially since it had met in early morning before the sun had come up, before the temple um, uh, sacrifices had could be done. And now they have to turn over Jesus Christ to the legal authority, the Romans, that the Jewish people, even though they may come to a an agreement that Jesus was worthy of death, they did not have the ability to carry out that sentence that was left to the Roman government. And so they had to somehow convince Pilate, the Roman governor of that area, that Jesus Christ was worthy of death. And so if you don't mind, take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Gospel record of Mark. The Gospel record of Mark in chapter number 15. The Gospel record of Mark in chapter 15, and notice with me in verse 1. Mark chapter 15 in verse 1, the Bible says this, And straightway in the morning the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and bound Jesus and carried him away, and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude crying out loud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered unto them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said unto, again unto them, What will ye then that I do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him! Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him! So Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And if you don't mind, as we come to this story here, this historical account, we can see this historical event of Jesus before Pilate. Jesus before Pilate. And if you don't mind, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. 
And as we come up to you now, we're just asking that you would give us grace. Give us mercy, especially as we apply this message, that we would get the correct interpretation, the, great, the correct application, that we could apply it to our lives, that it would make a difference. Lord, as we see this choice that is made and what the people chose, we realize that we too have a choice and help us to choose correctly. Lord, I'm asking that you would give us grace, give us mercy. Again, the best I know how I surrender myself to you. Fill me with your precious spirit and you guide and direct. You put things in place to honor yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now as we come to this historical event, we come to the real life date according to our calendar of Thursday, April 1st of AD 30. Jesus Christ has already had uh, a busy day that remember the Hebrew day started at sunset and at sunset he had the last supper with his disciples. He took time to instruct them. He's already prayed at the guard of Gethsemane. He's been put on a false trial and it's not even seven o'clock yet. So finally, they come to the place where they have to do something with Jesus. And so the first thing we come to you in this passage is the silence of Jesus. The silence of Jesus. It says in chapter 15 in verse 1, And straightway in the morning. So again, remember this illegal trial had been held before the official morning started. The official morning would begin at 6 o'clock a.m. with the... Um, the morning sacrifices and it would begin the Hebrew day and there would be certain sacrifices that would be done at the temple and certain psalms that would be sung out loud just to begin their regular day. And so once this is done and the official day has begun that the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. So remember that the previous night what they had done is that it was the Pharisees, the part of the Sanhedrin that had this illegal trial. They only invited the people that hated Jesus. They didn't invite anyone else. And then in the morning, as everybody else started to wake up, they began to grab, grab the scribes and they began to grab, uh, grab the elders and began to say, last night we had a trial. Early this morning we had a trial. We found this Jesus guilty. Do you guys agree? And it was already done deal, but they had this agreement and they bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. Now, Pilate is the Roman governor at this time. Now, previously before, you had Herod the Great. When he died, you had Herod Archelaus, who went so crazy that the Roman government actually had to replace him. And then they had put their own governor there to kind of oversee this whole Judea region. Now, the problem was is that the Hebrew people, and we're going to talk more about this in a moment, had, were not very submitted to the Roman government. And so whoever was going to be the governor, this was not the position you wanted to advance your career. And whoever had this had to deal with all these troublesome Jews, these Jewish people that gave problems all the time. And so it was not an easy job. And so you had to deal with people who are ready to erupt at any time. You had to deal with the people who actually had a yearly eruption. And we'll talk more about this. But he did not have an easy job. So when he comes... So early in the morning when the religious leaders in concert, in unison, come dragging in a prisoner and say, hey, we want to put this guy to death, you almost have to pay attention to them. You have to listen to their commands because you cannot rule or govern the territory without the Pharisees' approval. So now he's on a political tightrope. He does not have absolute power. He can't just tell them to buzz off. He cannot rule without them. So they've carried in Jesus. He's bound. He's tied up. And then so Pilate begins to examine him. Verse number two. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Now this is an interesting question. If you might remember that several days before on Sunday, the people were screaming and shouting, sing Hosanna. This is our king. This is the one that's delivered. The whole city had erupted. Pilate knew about this. He had heard about the celebration. He had heard about the people welcoming the king of the Jews into the city. And now he's standing here before Pilate. 
And so Pilate's asking a natural question. A couple days ago, the whole town was saying, you're the king of the Jews. Are you the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, thou sayest. So basically he said yes. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answering nothing. Now remember, we see this in another gospel record, that Jesus Christ had been found guilty of blasphemy against the Hebrew God. However, the Romans didn't care. So in order to sell a death sentence, they changed the crime from blasphemy to sedition. The word sedition carries the idea with the purpose of overthrowing the legitimate government. And so here they have Jesus and they're accusing him before the Roman governor how Jesus has been planning to get rid of the Romans. And that if you allow him to go free, he's going to put up an insurrection. He is going to rebel. And so they begin to accuse them. But he, Jesus, answered nothing. Now Pilate had been dealing with several different people. He's put people to death before. Crucifixion was a horrible death sentence. But it was something the Romans did often. And so he had clearly uh, ruled people to death before. And most people would beg their life. Some people would fight. Some people would yell. And here's Jesus. While these priests are accusing Jesus, he says nothing. How would your face be if you were already put on a legal trial and now you're before the person who could put you to death and they're still telling lies, what would your face be like? And he's saying nothing. Nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. Pilate's amazed to listen to all the list of stuff and how Jesus is just taking it, saying nothing. That amazed uh, Pilate more than if Jesus tried to defend himself. He was amazed. All of this is bringing Pilate to the conclusion that Jesus is innocent. It doesn't say that here in the gospel record of Mark, but in the other gospel records, it does say, I find no fault in him. There's there's nothing to it. He goes through and interrogates Jesus, and when he's done, he's convinced that Jesus is innocent. But he's standing on a political powder keg. But Jesus answered him nothing, so that Pilate marveled. He was just amazed. Here's someone who's not begging, not getting angry, not pleading, not getting uh, frustrated. Silence. And he watched as Jesus did this. Which brings us to a second thing here. The prisoner Barabbas. The prisoner Barabbas. Notice with me in verse number 6. Now at that feast, he released Unto them one prisoner, whosoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. Now with this, we have to understand a little bit of political, uh, what's going on in the political world. The Hebrew people had been conquered by Alexander the Great in about 332 B.C., After that, uh, Alexander the Great's empire had broken up into four places. The two places that concerned Israel would be uh, the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemies. The Seleucids would be in what we would call Syria. The Ptolemies would be in Egypt. And in between them in the buffer zone would be Israel. And they played political football with Israel going back and forth and invading and taking over. And eventually the... um, Hebrew people had won their independence from the Greek empire, from the Greek uh, (laughs) two empires nearby them with the Ptolemy rebellion and just an amazing story of what had happened there. But they had won their independence and they were free. That was until some other foreigner had made an agreement with the Roman government that said, hey, I'll sell you this piece of property. I'll sell you Judea. How about we make a deal? And we make this agreement. By the way, that, man, <coughs> who, uh, that man's son became Herod the Great. 
But basically, overnight, without any warning, without being conquered, the Hebrew people were sold into the Roman Empire. And so can you imagine come, waking up one morning and saying, Hey, congratulations! You're part of the Roman Empire! Well, how did this happen? And because they were never conquered, because they never had a say, they were never invaded, their civilization never collapsed, the Hebrew people had always resisted joining the Roman Empire. Now, we can understand the Germanic people as Julius Caesar came and took the Germanic people. They were conquered. They were put in part of the empire. As they, Julius Caesar went and went to Gaul and he conquered it. Because they were conquered, they, were put a, they become subjugated people. But the Hebrew people were not conquered. They were sold in some back alley deal. Their independence was taken away from them and they didn't have a say of it. So because of that, the Hebrew people had tried to rebel every chance they got. What made it worse was the Passover period. That to the Hebrew people, the most important holiday of all of their seven feast days would be the Passover. And the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, came from all over to come to the temple to observe the Passover. And when you got all of these Hebrew people into one small little city... And you got enough feelings and enough people that didn't like the government and enough people that were uh, uh, hated the Romans and wanted to do this. You had enough people there that there was always at this time of year, every year, an insurrection. And so you could almost mark it on your calendar. All right, when is violence going to break out? When are they going to turn into a mob? Passover time. In fact, they actually had a political party called the Zealots. And the Zealots were a political party that hated the Roman government so much that they would do assassinations to Roman officials or to any collaborators like publicans, tax collectors, who would uh, work with the Roman government in their eyes against the Hebrew people. And so this year was no different than as the people had gathered into the Passover period. Here is a man by the name of Barabbas. Barabbas had worked with his cohorts. and They had tried to already assassinate or they had already successfully killed a couple people. And trying to stir up the mob. Let's overthrow the Roman government. Let's storm the palace. Let's get rid of Pilate. And he was caught as part of this conspiracy. And so here is Barabbas, who is already tied up. He's already found guilty. He was headed to the cross because of him and his violence and his murder and trying to overthrow the Roman government. And so Pilate, the people are, have, um, have expected of each of the Roman governors that they made a, a, a thing to, in order to pacify, to, in order to make the people happy, every year the Roman governor would release a political prisoner to the people in order to pacify them, to say, hey, I'm not against you, let me prove it, I'm going to pardon him. He's worthy of death, but I'm going to pardon him. And so outside of the palace gates, the crowd started to cry uh, and assemble because they had expected Pilate to let someone go. And so he said, I know this. Let me, I could do two birds with one stone. The, he, the Pharisees want Jesus to be found guilty. And that he would be found worthy of death. They want him discredited. But the people expect uh, me to release someone. So what I'm going to do is I'll declare him guilty. Present him before the people. A couple days ago, the people said that Jesus was their king. They're going to want their king to be released. I satisfy both parties. This was his thinking. This was his hope. But he did not realize the hatred the Pharisees had against Jesus. And so his goal was to get Jesus up against the very worst, vilest prisoner that he had. If you had the serial killer loose and the son of God 
Which one would you choose to be released? The one that's fed you miracles. The one that's done, fed people with the loaves of fishes. The ones that's caused the blind to see. Those that have done things. Do you want the guy who healed the sick? Or do you want the serial killer? Which one? And he was hoping it would be an easy choice. But it didn't work out that way. Here is Barabbas. And here is Jesus. What's interesting to note is Barabbas' first name was Jesus. So you had the choice. The crowd had to choose. Which Jesus do you want? Which Jesus? Do you want the Jesus who is the king of the Jews? He does miracles. He can answer your prayers. But he is also the king Or do you want Jesus who is not going to help you at all? The Jesus that's going to end up hurting you. The Jesus that's going to do you wrong. Which Jesus do you want? And so the crowd had the choice between two Jesuses. Which brings me to the third thing I want to show you here. The choice between Jesus and Barabbas. The choice between Jesus and Barabbas. So notice as Pilate sets this up. Now again, he has in mind it's going to go one way. And he's so surprised with the outcome. Notice verse 8. And the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. Which is to release one of these political prisoners. But Pilate answered them saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered them for envy. Once again, we're seeing his mind. He says, the people are going to want Jesus. Forget what the priest says. I've done my thing, called him guilty. The people let him loose. What am I to do? But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. These sly dogs, what they did is they started to slip into the crowd And you know, there's something, people have done studies on mobs. Once mobs get together, they don't think for themselves anymore. They begin to have a collective consciousness. And that if someone makes a decision, the whole mob moves with them. If you need a study on mobs, just watch our history for the last month or so. And so... What happens is the Pharisees have people all throughout the crowd. And so you have the crowd, someone in the crowd start, Barabbas! We want Barabbas! And another Pharisee, we want Barabbas! And another one, we want Barabbas! And so the crowd, because they don't think for themselves, start to shout Barabbas. We want Barabbas. And they stir up the whole crowd as a mob. And Pilate answered and said unto them again, What would you have that I do to whom you call the king of the Jews? He's trying to lead them on. Hey, this is the guy you said the king of the Jews. What do you want me to do with him? I'll release him if you ask for him. Come on. Tell me. Help me out. This is your king, the king of the Jews. Hello. Pick him. And they cried out again. Notice this. Who is this they? The chief priest moved the people. It's also that chief priest who also started the chant, crucify him, crucify him. And the mob got swept up with this. That you had a couple people keely placed to get the mob stirred up. And now they're all chanting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. By the way, by this time, once a mob starts going, they no longer have reason. He asked a legitimate question. Why should we put him to death? There was no answer. The mob had just entered into that mentality. Crucify him. We don't know why. Just crucify him. Because that's what everybody else is doing. Everyone else has crucified him. So crucify him. 
Crucify him. Crucify him. They don't know why. They just know that's what we're supposed to do. Because the mob is stirred up. Crucify him. So, and so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them. He gave them the wrong Jesus. The Jesus that they called for. The murderer. And when he had scourged and delivered Jesus, and when he had scourged him, let's pause here. The other gospel records explain more. But what Pilate did is he scourged Jesus. And I'll talk more about the death of Jesus, not this Sunday, but next Sunday. If you've never heard the medical explanation of how Jesus died on the cross, I don't want to say you're in for a treat, but you're going to be in for something very informative. Not this Sunday, but next Sunday. As we medically explain what happened to Jesus Christ up on the cross. But when Pilate scourged him, the Bible, or the first century historian Josephus said, after someone was scourged, uh, basically a scourge was a cat of nine tails, a whip with nine straps on it. At the end of it, it had hooks and rocks, and it was made to pierce into the flesh and tear it. The first century uh, historian Josephus said, after one scourge, one lash, you could take your finger and actually touch the bone of the victim. And so Pilate scourged Jesus with the idea to save Jesus' life. You say, how does this work? Well, he took Jesus and he scourged him. He was but, uh, battered and bruised. His back looked like hamburger meat. Then he took on a white robe and put it on and let the blood soak into that robe. And so Jesus is a battered, bloody mess. And he brings him for the crowd Hoping that when the crowd would see this bloody, battered Jesus, that they would be revolted and they would say, never mind, he's suffered enough. When they would actually see someone who is mangled so badly. But again, there's something about a mob. That a mob doesn't stop. And he ended up crucifying Jesus afterwards. By the way, this is why it talks about in the book of Isaiah 52 and 53, that no man suffered like Jesus. Normally the Romans when they would crucify them didn't go with the scourging. They would just put them up on the cross. But Jesus went through two death sentences. The scourging. Then the death on the cross. Two things that had never been put together before or since as far as we know. Plus the other things that Jesus went through. Again Next Sunday morning, as we medically explain the death of Jesus on the cross, will be something that may be an interest to you. But again, Pilate is doing everything he can to save Jesus' life, to convince the crowd to choose him. I believe that Pilate would have said, you know what, I've already released Barabbas, but if you want Jesus, I'll release him too. But not to be. Which brings us to something interesting. There is a choice between two Jesuses. Two Jesuses. One of them is the king of the Jews. The other one is a false Jesus. A Jesus that can't save. A Jesus that can't help you. A Jesus that made the crowd feel better, but didn't do anything for them. Now, why is this so important? You say, well, I chose Jesus. Yes, but you have to understand that the Jesus of the Bible is different than a lot of the Jesuses that is toted around. The Jesus of the Bible is different than the Jesus of the television show. That the Jesus of the Bible is quite a bit different Jesus than the Jesus of a lot of the songs that are out there. That the Jesus of the Bible is a different Jesus than a lot of the books write about. The Jesus of the Bible is often different than what people imagine Jesus to be like. You know, the Bible speaks about this. Turn with me, if you don't mind, to the book of 1 John, chapter number 4. The book of 1 John, chapter number 4. The book of 1 John is found at the end of the Bible. You have the book of Revelation. Then you come to the book of Jude. 3 John, 2 John, 1 John. 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter 4. And notice with me, starting at verse 1. Beloved, believe not 
every spirit. But try the spirit, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. This is still true of our day. Many false prophets have come out. By the way, I want you to ask this question. What are the false false prophets telling people about? Notice verse 2. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confessed that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now, back in John's day, there was a big conspiracy, uh, uh, theological uh, doctrine that was going on that said that if Jesus is truly a spirit, that he could not be in the flesh. And John's saying, nah, uh he was there, I handled him, I touched him, I ate with him, he's true. But there are people that are saying, the Jesus that you heard of is not right. And they're trying to tell people about a different Jesus. Notice. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus has come of the flesh is not of God. So anything that tries to give you a different Jesus that is not the Jesus of the Bible is not of God. And notice this. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard it, should come. And even now, already, present tense is in the world. Now, most of the time when you see the word Antichrist, most people think of a person who's coming later on. But John does not use the word Antichrist in the connotation of a person. He says it is a spirit of Antichrist. Now let's define our words. Many people believe that word anti means against. And so don't believe on something that's against Christ. But that word anti actually carries along with the idea of replacing. And so the spirit of Antichrist is not trying to be against Christ. It is something that is trying to replace Christ. It's giving you a different Jesus. May I give you an example? We have our Jehovah Witness friends. Who claim that Jesus Christ is not God, but he was the first of God's creation. And then after he was created, then he created the rest of the world. And so they do not claim that Jesus is God. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. They are sending you a different Jesus. Our Mormon friends say that Jesus Christ is the brother of Lucifer. And... That if you are a good Mormon, when you die, you become a brand new God of a brand new world. And a brand new Jesus will die for those people on that world. They're teaching a different Jesus. They're saying, we believe in Jesus. Do you believe in Jesus? And they use the word Jesus. However, the Jesus that they try to sell you is not the same as the Jesus of the Bible. And again, I want to remind you that the spirit of Antichrist is in the world. It's not the spirit of against Christ, even though that is in the world. It's the spirit of replacing the Jesus of the Bible with a different Jesus. This is why the Bible says to try the spirits. To see if they are a God. And your purpose is to line up with The Bible. You are not supposed to make Jesus out of your own imagination. Maybe I could put it this way. Our theology, what we believe to be true about God, should develop our philosophy, what we believe to be true about the world. However, many people do it backwards. They start with their philosophy and make that affect their theology. So how they see the world makes them affect how they see Jesus. That is not the Jesus of the Bible. We have to start with the Jesus of the Bible. That is who we're talking about. But there are many replacement Jesuses out there. And the Bible goes on and talks quite a bit. It actually talks about it. If you follow the wrong Jesus, you can lose your rewards in the millennial kingdom. May I show that to you really quick? Notice with me in the book of 2 John. (laughs) The book of 2 John. Still with that same idea here, this is important. Notice with me in uh, 2 John, notice with me in verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus is 
come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Remember, replacing Christ. They're telling you about a different Jesus. They're saying, Jesus, oh, I love Jesus. But which Jesus are we talking about? Barabbas? Or the Jesus of the Bible? The Jesus of Hollywood? Or the Jesus of Bible? The Jesus of Nashville? Or the Jesus of the Bible? The Jesus of Rome? Or the Jesus of the Bible? Which Jesus? This is why we have to discern what does the Bible say about Jesus. Not what do you think Jesus is. Not how do you see Jesus. What does the Bible say about Jesus? That Jesus. Notice this verse 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but we receive a full reward. So notice this. This isn't talking about unsaved people. This is talking about saved people who are following a different Jesus than the Jesus of the Bible that you can lose your rewards. Not your salvation, but lose your rewards. This is big stuff. Verse number 9. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ or our belief and teaching about the Jesus of the Bible hath both the Father and the Son. And if any come unto you and bring not this doctrine or the doctrine of Christ, receive him not in your house, neither bid him God speed. That means that if a Mormon knocks on your door and says, can I tell you about the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? You're not even to let him in your house. The Bible is very clear, or you could lose your reward, but it goes further. It says you're not even supposed to wish him God speed. Today we would say God bless you. You're not even say to God bless you to a Mormon or to someone teaching a false Jesus, because if you do, it's like you're giving them approval. And you can lose your rewards. As a side note, this is why I teach our folks uh, to say kazutite when someone sneezes. That just means good health. It's German for good health. Rather than say, God bless you. Because <laughs> there are some things that God does not want to bless. God does not want to bless a false Jesus. We have to be careful with even the words that we sling out, by the way, on a daily basis. But notice this in verse 11. For he that biddeth him God speed or God bless you is a partaker of his evil deeds. Now this is some strong language. Now as we come back to the choice between the Jesus of the Bible or the Jesus that is none of the Bible. Why is this a big deal to us? Let me explain. Remember what Pilate was telling the people who Jesus was, the king of the Jews. This is the choice you make. If you make the choice of the Jesus of the Bible, you're choosing someone to be in charge of you. You are choosing, when you choose Jesus, you lose power and control. And you submit to Jesus Because the Jesus of the Bible is the God of the universe. When you choose Jesus, you're saying he is the one who's able to tell me what to do. Not me tell him what to do. Not me to do whatever I want and expect him to pat me on the head. This is why people have a hard time. Because they would rather have the Jesus that lets them do whatever they want. They would rather have the Jesus that lets them sin and sin and sin. And just say, I'm sorry. And go do whatever they want again. They want the Jesus where they could show up to a church and sing a song and have a lighter and their tears running down their eyes. Oh, I love this. And walk out and fall back into the same sin and never change. That's the Jesus they want. But the Jesus of the Bible is the God of the universe. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the one that we are going to stand before and give an account to. One day. We have to be careful. Where do you get your information about Jesus? By the way, if you're not reading your Bible, you're getting your information about Jesus from somewhere. The Jesus of the Christian songs is often not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus that you see on Hollywood. It's amazing to see how much theology, Bible knowledge people get from Hollywood. For example, remember the old Ten Commandments show that used to come on on Resurrection Sunday and people would skip church to watch it on Sunday night and Moses and Charleston Heston coming down. 
You know how inaccurate that movie is, but most people think that's a correct version. And they get their correct their idea of the story of Moses from Charleston Heston rather than the Bible. I'm giving you an example. Now, our next series is the life of Moses. When we get done with that, then watch the Ten Commandments and laugh at it and go, ooh, this is pretty inaccurate. And if they could fool you on Moses, imagine what they're trying to do with you about Jesus. Now, why is this a big deal? Because if you choose the Jesus of the Bible, you're also choosing the one who's the boss of you. You're choosing the Jesus who could tell you what to do in every aspect of your life. Now, that's, we don't like what people tell us what to do, but let me tell you, Jesus knows best. He has the best for you. He knows exactly what you need. When you submit to Him, you're not giving up anything, but you're gaining everything. Because He can lead you on the right path. He knows what to do. But to choose any other Jesus makes us still in charge. And that we had the choice. I can listen to you if I want, eh, but I don't want to, I'm fine. And we don't have to obey His words. That's the Jesus that most people like to listen to. Which Jesus is yours? Because you have to choose. You have to make a choice. And if you pick the Jesus of the Bible, then you need to go to the Bible and find more about him and what he wants you to do and delight in what he has given you to do. Remember the Bible talks about in the book of 1 John that his commandments are not grievous. It's not a big deal at all to obey Jesus because he knows what's best. When we obey ourselves, when we're in charge, we mess everything up. Which Jesus do you want? Why do not people want the Jesus of the Bible? Because they don't want him to have control. That's the very bottom line. They don't want the Jesus of the Bible to tell them what to do. They don't want to submit to his authority. Why was it that the Pharisees did not want the Jesus of the Bible? Because they did not want his authority. And so the question I have for you tonight, which is, One of the most important questions you could ask yourself as a Christian. Which Jesus do you follow? The Jesus of the Bible or some other Jesus? How can you tell? Because if you choose the Jesus of the Bible, you're also willing to obey that king. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you now... People are in an important choice whether they realize it or not. Which Jesus are we going to follow? The Bible says, I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I'd rather have Jesus than wealth untold. I'd rather have Jesus than anything that this world affords today. Is that a true statement? Would you rather have Jesus in your life? Would you rather have Jesus be the one who directs your life? That's the best choice you could ever make. Or are you satisfied with some watered down form of Jesus? Sure, he may carry the same name, but he no longer is your authority. Which Jesus will you choose? Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. 
we would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.